Good morning, church. It is great to see you here this morning. As we prepare this morning to take the Lord's Supper, let's remember the salvation that is found in Jesus as it tells us in 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's stand together now and praise the God who loves us so much he sent his son to die in our place. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend He is my strength He is my portion With me in the valley Oh uh-huh. 
Amen. Please be seated this morning as we turn our eyes to the baptistry as we continue to worship through the ordinance of baptism this morning. Well, good morning, church. To, today's an exciting day for uh, my family. I have Brennig Yates joining me here in the baptistry. And uh, at this point, Brennig Yates is my only son-in-law, so he happens to be my favorite son-in-law <laughs> right now. Uh, if, you're, if you're family of Brennig, would you stand for just a moment? He's married to my oldest daughter, um, Isabella, and so uh, we're thankful for him. Uh, Brennig's coming today for baptism, not as a brand new believer. He's been walking with the Lord since he was 14 years old. But this is an opportunity to follow through with the baptism by immersion, uh, recognizing how this pictures for us the, the death and resurrection of Christ and how we die with Christ spiritually and are resurrected to new life in salvation through him. And so that's what we want to do today, and we're excited to do that. Uh, Brandon, just a, a couple of questions. Have you... Have you confessed your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone? I have. And are you committed to follow him all the days of your life? I do. And what is your profession of faith? I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. We'll be from my sins. Absolutely. And based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in his death, <laughs> raised to walk in new life. Good morning, church. Our service is off to a great start already. My name is Zach Scog, and I'm the missions and college pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church, where we exist to proclaim Christ, to make disciples of those who claim Christ, all for the glory of Christ. And when we say that mission statement, we have to ask the question, well, who is Trinity Baptist Church then? Trinity is not just our staff members. Trinity is not just this building. Trinity is all of us collectively. Our mission as a church is to proclaim Christ, to make disciples, and to glorify Christ. If you're a visitor with us today, we're so glad that you're joined with us. And we want to ask you if you would fill out the Connect card in the pew rack in front of you. And that'll just give us an opportunity to contact you, to get to know you better, and to connect with you. You can fill those out and drop those in the giving boxes in the back of the room. Or you can take them out the double doors in the back to our welcome center after the service. And we would love to just receive that card from you there and meet you there. If you're joining us on the live stream, we're glad you're with us. If you would click the link to the connect card and fill that out, we would love to just get in contact with you as well. And we are hoping that you can join with us in person soon. Church, what a blessing it is to gather together as the people of God and to sing praises to him. And I want us to stand together this morning and continue singing praises to our God. Would you stand with us? We need you every hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine. Oh 
Would you join me in reading John 1, 29 and 30 in verse 34? The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before, because he was before me. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Head of sorrow, son of suffering. Let's sing this together. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who leads. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me.
Let's pray together. Father, what a great day this is to be gathered together as a body of Christ, to be able to witness this baptism today, Lord. What a glorious thing. Father, we're grateful that we can gather together and be lifting your voices up to praise and to pray to you. Father, we approach you with hearts full of worship and gratitude. We thank you for the love that never fails, for your mercy that is new every morning. And most of all, we thank you for your son, for his sacrifice on the cross that has given us access to your holy presence, God. Thank you for making a way for us to be able to come and meet with you today. I thank you for our pastor. I pray for him as he brings the message today, God. You empower him. I pray, God, that you will speak to us. God, we ask for your Holy Spirit that would be upon us as we worship you in spirit and truth with all our hearts, minds, and strength. Renew our minds, Lord. Transform us to be more like your son, Jesus. And it's his precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John in chapter 13, if you will. While you're turning there, I have a question for you. What is your most memorable meal ever? I mean, most of us have a meal that was very memorable to us. So for instance, perhaps it was memorable because of the uniqueness of what you ate. If you've ever been on a foreign mission trip, you have eaten some unique food. You remember those meals. In fact, uh, you can't forget those meals, even if you wish you could forget those meals. Maybe the meal was memorable because of where you were, or who you were with, or what you were celebrating. Maybe it was memorable for very good reasons. Maybe it was the first date with your future spouse, or maybe it was a special birthday meal, or maybe it was memorable because the reasons weren't so great. We were living in California at the time, this was in the 1980s, and we spent a lot of time with my stepdad's sister's family. At the time they had four kids and we would always hang out with them and do different things. We lived in different cities in Southern California, but we would regularly meet with them. Well, one time we met at this buffet. So we were eating at uh, this all-you-can-eat buffet and I threw down all I could eat, and unfortunately, I threw back up all that I ate that day. And I'm telling you, it was memorable. Every family gathering, when we get together, we haven't done this for years now, that we would, that we would meet, our, eventually both families actually moved to North Carolina as well, so we had a lot of connection with them. One of my cousins would bring up that day every single time. And I'm certain that if we were to meet again today, all together, someone would bring that time up. Well, this morning, we're going to be looking at what is perhaps the most memorable meal of all times, what is known as the Lord's Supper. And the Olympic mockery of this meal aside what took place at the Passover meal, the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples prior to his crucifixion, was so significant that the church has celebrated it ever since. The essence of this meal, friends, is the remembrance of Jesus Christ and a looking forward to his coming back again. So as we will be partaking of the meal together today, let's consider Jesus the sacrificial Savior. So will you stand? We're going to read here in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 21 and reading through verse 30. John 13, that says 1 through 20, but it's 21 through 30. The sacrificial Savior. 
After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at, table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him and asked Jesus, motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do it quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for these moments that we have together to be in your word, to look to Jesus, the sacrificial Savior, and to celebrate what he has done in his coming again. Thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your grace. God, we worship you. This morning, would you meet us here in Jesus' name? Amen. And you may be seated. Well, last week we learned that the events that take place in chapters 13 through 17 all happen in what is called the upper room. And we began with the the washing of the disciples' feet. When Jesus humbles himself and he washes the disciples' feet, and then uh, this week they come to the table, and soon the actual dialogue is what is going to, the official dialogue, the upper room dialogue is going to start, but we're looking at what took place just before Jesus' death. In chapter 13 and verse 1, we learn that Jesus knew that his time had come. In other words, he understood that the very reason he came to pay for the sin of the world was upon him. He would soon be betrayed. He would soon be beaten and then crucified. And then on the third day, he would rise again. Now, while the other three gospel writers focus more on the significance of the meal itself, John here, what we just read, focuses his, our attention on the conversation that Jesus has, specifically his suggestion that he is about to be betrayed. And what this tells us is, what this shows us is, Jesus' sovereignty and his foreknowledge of everything that is about to take place. So first this morning, as we think of the sacrificial Savior Let's remember the Lamb of God. Remember the Lamb of God. So let's just take a quick step back and recall how Jesus got to this place. How Jesus and his disciples got to what is called the upper room. So flip with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke in chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 13. Luke 22, 7 through 13. So Jesus is now in Jerusalem, just moments before he will be crucified. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. So here they are, they're they're. They're going into Jerusalem. They're staying right outside of it. He sends his disciples into the city. And Jesus says, look for this man. This is what he's going to say. You go with him and you follow him. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the the Passover combine together to make an eight-day celebration. These two 
feasts and celebrations were so connected that mostly people just understood them to be uh, refer to one another. So remember, this is a celebration of who God is. It's a remembrance of his delivering the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, where they were in slavery for some 400 years. And every year, according to the law, the Jews would gather together as family units at the Passover, and they would celebrate that God spared the firstborn of all Israel because they uh, took the lamb, an unblemished lamb, and killed it and painted the blood around the doorposts of their homes, and the death angel would pass over their house. So they were celebrating the deliverance that came through God and the, the saving that came through the blood of the lamb. This was an important feast for the life of the Israelites. But the question we have to ask is, why did the Israelites have to kill a lamb and paint their doorposts with the blood of the lamb? And the answer is because it it wasn't just the Egyptians who were the sinners. It wasn't just the oppressive, oppressing Egyptians who were guilty of sin. No, the Israelites were guilty of sin against God just like the Egyptians. The Israelites were deserving of God's wrath and judgment, just like the Egyptians, just like every one of us who has sinned. And that's everyone. In Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 22, we read that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So when God instructed the Israelites to take that blood of the lamb and to paint on the doorpost, he's saying there is shedding of blood and this is a substitute for what you deserve. God is making a way. And in doing so, in, in, in obeying God here, the Israelites are confessing. They're agreeing with God. We are guilty. We need blood to cover us. So the question then is, why is Jesus' death associated with the Passover? This is all taking place at the Passover, and Jesus understands that his time had come. The very hour, the very reason for which he had come is upon him. Well, can't you hear John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or don't you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when Paul says that Christ is our Passover lamb, that he has been sacrificed? Jesus, the sinless Son of God, is the ultimate Passover lamb because only his blood can remove our sin stains. And because only his blood can cleanse our hearts and our minds in order that we might serve the one true and living God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And his death serves as the substitute for our sin, for us. And all who will recognize their sin and put their hope and their trust in him, in that sense, applying his blood will be forgiven and will be saved. Church, we must remember the Lamb of God. But secondly, we are to remember the lead of God. Remember the lead of God. So Jesus instructs Peter and John to go and to make ready the Passover meal. And they ask for more directions. Okay, well, you want us to go. You want us to make it ready. But where are we going to do it? And of course, as we read earlier from Luke's gospel, Jesus gives them very clear instructions. He says, you're going to see this guy. I want you to go to this guy. I want you to enter into his home. And I want you to say, the teacher, Jesus referring to himself, says, where is the room that we are going to celebrate the Passover? Everything happens like Jesus said it would happen. In fact, in verse 13, what we read earlier in, in, John, in Luke uh, 22, Luke tells us that everything happened that way. It happened just as Jesus said it would. Friends, doesn't this show us that God is in control? Doesn't this show us that every detail is known by God? 
that there is nothing outside of the scope of his knowledge, outside the scope of his control, that our God is sovereign and worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise, even to the minute details of our lives, our God reigns. But don't miss the obvious here. Peter and John followed Jesus's lead. They were willing to do what Jesus instructed them to do. And church, as followers of Christ, we are responsible to do what Jesus tells us to do. As followers of Christ, we are called to follow his lead. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 21, which we'll get to in a few weeks, Jesus says, he who loves me keeps my commands. He who loves me, we could substitute that, follows my lead. We are to remember the lead of God. Let's go back to John in chapter 13. After washing their feet, Jesus hinted at Judas's betrayal, suggesting that the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9. Look at John chapter 13 and verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. So there is this, this veiled reference to the betrayal that's going to take place. But it's not overly clear. But then at the meal, after he's done washing their feet at the meal, we're told here Jesus is troubled in spirit and he just comes out and he says it. One of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. Now, given that the Passover meal was to be a celebrative meal, a time to remember all that God had done for them, Jesus' statement was a shocker. I mean, just imagine, you're at a much anticipated family meal, and it's just a celebration time. And then someone comes out and says something that just shocks everyone. You could imagine that the mood changed instantly. One of you is going to betray me. The word betray means to give over to another with unjust or evil motives and intentions. According to Matthew's gospel, Matthew 26, verse 22 the disciples were shocked. They were sorrowful even. And they began to talk amongst themselves saying, is it I, Lord? Is it I? They couldn't believe this. And let me just say, I think the disciples' humble response is instructive to us. May we never become so arrogant. May we never become so confident in our own strength that we think everything's just fine. No, may we at some level remain leery of ourselves so that we will rely more on Jesus, so that we'll be more intentional about walking with the Spirit, recognizing that we don't have the strength, the power to walk faithfully with Jesus in and of ourselves. No, may we seek grace that we would not fall into temptation. Well, as John records it, I imagine Peter there kind of bumping John. That's the one who is sitting right next to Jesus. Hey, ask him who it is. John, find out, get some more information. Help, help us know what's going on here. John, just, just ask Jesus. In verse 27, we read that after Judas had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Now, previously in Chapter, in chapter 13 and verse 2, we read that the devil had already put it in Jesus' heart to betray Jesus. Luke's gospel actually tells us that Judas at this point had already met with the religious leaders. So we understand here there's a, there's a lot of information. Judas was being led by his own sin, but Judas was being tempted by Satan. He was responsible for his own sin. He, he willingly betrayed Jesus in his own volition. However, we understand that God oversaw everything that took place, and he got that morsel, and Satan entered him. And Jesus said, what you're going to do, you go and do quickly. 
But the question for us is this, how could this have happened? I mean, Judas was close to Jesus. Judas was close to Jesus. He saw Jesus' power. He understood his compassion. He heard his merciful and his gracious words. Beyond that, Judas was in good company. I mean, he had built-in accountability. He had built-in encouragement. By all outward appearances, Judas was in a prime position. I mean, he was one of the 12. He was a follower. He was called a disciple. Once when my boys were younger, we were reading this account together, and we we, we read through it, and I remember, but Daddy, Judas was an apostle. I know, son, but he chose to reject and betray Jesus. Well, well, Daddy, then why did Jesus pick Judas in the first place? Well, that's a good question, son, but it's time to go to sleep now, okay? <laughs> we don't know. But that's how this shook out. And Judas should serve as a warning for all of us. Judas should serve as a warning to all who profess faith in Jesus Christ, but whose hearts are far from him. For those who follow on the outside, but don't follow his lead in their hearts. I mean, see this, friends. During the years that Judas followed Jesus, he was involved with all sorts of religious activity. But at the end of the day, none of that amounted to anything for Judas. He was going through the motions, but his heart was far from God. He was never transformed by the grace of God. And that's a warning, friends. I wonder if there are some even here this morning who, from the outside look pretty good but on the inside there is no transformation by the grace of God and you know this you're doing the religious activities but you don't have a deep love for Christ you don't have a deep desire to follow him to follow his lead to deny yourself and to carry your cross That's not really in your understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. I'm just going to kind of do the outside activity. But has it transformed you? Has it made a difference in your life? Well, Jesus dismisses Judas and tells him to do quickly what he's going to do which is to betray him to the religious leaders. So uh, in Luke's gospel, we have this statement, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. In other words, as God has ordained, as God has planned, but woe to that man by whom the Son is, by whom he is betrayed, the Son is betrayed. And ultimately, friends, this points us to the love of God. So lastly, we want to remember the love of God. Remember the love of God. When we consider Jesus' washing of disciples' feet, in the greater context, we can compare it to what we read last week in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let me just read it for you. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Friends, when Jesus rose from the table, 
and he set aside his outer garments and he took up the towel. He was humbling himself to wash the disciples' feet. And it is a picture of Jesus emptying himself and becoming a man and taking on the form of a servant even unto death. Church, this is the love of God. And this is what we are called to remember. And here we are at the Passover meal. And while John's gospel doesn't specifically specify this, Jesus is reinterpreting everything. Now, it may be helpful to know how the Passover meal flowed at this time and age. The actual meal actually uh, involved four official cups or drinks of wine. First, they would pass this cup of wine around the table. And after that, they would eat the traditional food, the bitter herbs and the roasted lamb. And it was here when those who were gathered would recount the story of what took place at the Exodus, how God delivered them with his power. Now, many believe this is the point when when Jesus would have dismissed Judas, that Judas wouldn't have been a part of the actual the uh, reinterpretation, the significance of what Jesus is doing. And so at this point, Jesus would have dismissed Judas. There's some, there's some disagreement about that, but that's probably where I land as well. After the recounting of the Exodus story, they would sing psalms and then they would drink from the second cup. Now, after the passing of the second cup, they would partake of the unleavened bread. Now, you remember, the unleavened bread... It was unleavened because the Israelites had to leave in haste. There wasn't time for the bread to rise. It was symbolic. They were just to go. So they were to eat unleavened bread. They were just to go. They were to get out of Egypt. They were to go quickly. Now, uh, traditionally, this would have, been, would have been eaten in silence. So they would have taken the unleavened bread and eaten in silence. However, it's here where Jesus will reinterpret What is taking place at the Passover meal? So in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26, Jesus says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, the unleavened bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So just imagine, here they are, they're celebrating the Passover. They've been doing this for as long as they can remember, and now Jesus is changing it. He's saying, this isn't just about what God did in the past. This is about what I'm doing now. This is my body, and it's broken for you. Of course, a picture of going to the cross of Christ. After the unleavened bread came the third cup, and then the singing of more psalms. And it was here that Jesus would have spoken of the blood of the covenant. Matthew 26, verse 27 through 29. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus here is authoritatively reinterpreting what the Passover is all about. And this now is pointing to his blood. His blood blood which is shed for the remission of sin which is shed to cover their sin while they were slaves in Egypt the blood of the lamb delivered the people from God's judgment on the firstborn the lamb was a substitute but Jesus is saying now that the wine represents his blood which is poured out for sinners in the new covenant Jesus dies in the place of sinners. Jesus is the substitute. After that, the fourth cup would be passed and the meal then would be finished. So look, the whole observance of Passover commemorated God's delivering Israel from bondage to Egypt. And this really opened up the picture of God taking Israel, his people from Egypt, bringing them to Sinai where he would give the covenant, the old covenant. But friends, the old covenant is something that none of us could fulfill. So what Jesus is saying is my people will be cared for through what is the new covenant, which Jesus fulfilled fully. 
through his sinlessness, through his death, and through his resurrection. Jesus is the Savior. The Savior who was sacrificed for our sin. His cross, our freedom. His stripes, our healing. His blood, still speaking. His love, still reaching. But he didn't stay dead. He rose to life on the third day. He defeated sin and death forever. And he gives life. He is life. And he gives hope. He is hope. And just as Jesus rose from washing the disciples' feet and returned to his place at the table, Jesus rose from the grave and he returned to his place next to the Father. And he has been given the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All praise King Jesus. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Now as we transition to Lord's Supper, we're going to spend some time uh, in quiet reflection, reflecting on Jesus' humiliation and his exaltation and what it means for us and how we are to live our lives in light of that. Now, friends, partaking of the Lord's Supper ought to cause us to reflect on our own lives. Are we following God's lead? Are we walking with the Spirit? Are we denying ourselves and carrying our crosses? So use this time to thank Jesus for his sacrifice and to confess known sin in your life and to ask God for grace to follow him even more closely. In a few moments, I'll come and I'll give some more explanation about what's going to take place. But let me just say this. This morning, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, we encourage you, we implore you not to partake of the elements. This is a privilege of the church, of those who are following Christ. And our Lord would say that to eat in an unworthy manner would be to... Uh, to bring condemnation upon yourself. So let's take some time and just quiet reflection and I'll come and give some more instructions here in just a moment. Son of man must go as is written of him. According to Isaiah 53, that meant being despised and rejected by men, bearing our griefs and being crushed for our iniquities. But it also meant that the Father would not abandon Jesus to Sheol or let the Holy One see corruption because God raised him from the dead. So we remember what Jesus has done and we celebrate what Jesus has done and we worship him for both. 
So here in just a moment, we're going to invite families and individuals to come forward to these tables. We have deacons in the back, and they will be allowing for rows to come forward. Just pay attention. I want you to exit out the left side of your aisle and then come back up on the right side of your aisle to return to your seat. Once you partake of the elements, please return and remain quiet. And then here in just a little bit, we will sing together. If you are not able to come forward to receive the elements, we also have some deacons in the back who will be able to bring elements to you so that you can partake right where you are. Just raise your hand or make eye contact with them and they will be ready to help you as well. After all have received the Lord's Supper, we'll encourage one another with song.
Let's stand together and sing as we rejoice in celebration. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who weeps. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Oh, hallelujah to the sun.
shed for the forgiveness of sins. So we praise him because he took our place on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you sent your son because you loved us. You sent him to be the propitiation for our sins. His body was broken. His blood was poured out on our behalf. And for that, we give thanks to you. God, we thank you that in him is hope. In the name of Jesus is hope and there is forgiveness of sin. So I pray if there is anybody in this place that does not know you, God, Lord, we pray collectively that you would convict them. You would draw them closer to yourself and that they would experience that there is hope in the name of Jesus Christ. Hope is not found in this world, but is in the person of Jesus. And as we follow you all the days of our lives, Lord, I pray that we would, as we go from this place, declare the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Be, that we would declare the forgiveness that you offer in him. And our lives would be devoted to you. And we would live lives worshipful to you in all that we do. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated for a few announcements this morning. My name is Hunter Wilkerson. And I'm the student pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. And at Trinity Baptist Church, we exist to proclaim Christ. And to make disciples of those who claim Christ. All for the glory of Christ. And one way we do that is through your faithful and generous giving. We thank you that you give so faithfully and out of love for Trinity Baptist so that we can make the name of Jesus known in our community. And thank you for your giving that supports our ministries at Trinity Baptist Church. If you would like to give today, as a reminder, you can give in the giving boxes as you leave the worship center today. There's giving boxes there or in the foyer. You can scan the QR code on the screen behind me on the, the QR code above the giving boxes that will take you to our online giving link. Or you can bring your, off, or your offering to the church office by physical, you can bring it in physically, or you can mail it to the church office. You can do either of those. So we are so thankful to God that he has blessed us with a giving and supporting church that we are able to seek the Lord together. And that we're able to do uh, ministries like our women's ministry. And our women's retreat is right around the corner. This is just an announcement to save the date for 
Friday, October 4th through Saturday, October 5th. Our, that will be our women's retreat, and sign-ups will begin next week. There will be a table outside the choir suite. Please sign up there for that. And church, as a reminder, we just want to um, make you aware that our Wednesday nights have started. We've had a great turnout. We've had a great couple Wednesday nights. But we want to invite you to keep coming, to come on back for a Wednesday night. There is child care for kids up to three years old. And for kids three years old through fifth grade, there's Equip Kids with Lily and Melissa. And then we have the gathering for our middle schoolers and high schoolers in the Rock Auditorium led by our student band and worship. And then we're preaching through the book of Colossians. And then our Equip You for Adults is downstairs with Pastor Tim. He's um, looking forward to having y'all there. So I encourage you to please come on back for our Wednesday nights. We would love to see you there. And then this morning, uh, we have also Brennick was baptized, but Isabella and Brennick are also going to be joining our church. So they are actually going to be up front at the end of service. If you want to come by and just welcome them to our congregation this morning. Before we get to be dismissed, hear these words from Jude. Jude says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Go in grace and peace, church. You are dismissed.